So hi, welcome everybody. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, I don't know why it's taken me so long to do this. Um, I thought about doing it last year and then I got sick. I was like coughing constantly for most of last year. Um, so it was, it was pretty difficult to do live videos, but here we are. So, um, yeah, tonight we're going to talk about my book, um, the INFJ user guide, which looks like this is backwards, but that's what it looks like. Um, there is a link for it, um, in my bio. If you haven't gotten your copy yet, it's available on Amazon through Kindle and it's available in paperback. Like this one is paperback. Um, every Thursday night for the next, um, how many chapters are there? 13 weeks, uh, we're going to be here. Um, except for the first Thursday in August, I'm actually going on a very mini short vacation. So we're going to skip that week, but every week after that, we'll be here. Um, and we're going to talk about one chapter per night. So the first chapter tonight, um, we'll just go ahead and dive in. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to, I think there's like a little question tab there. So feel free to submit questions and we'll use some time afterwards um, to answer any questions that you have about the book or about anything that you want to ask me a question about. Um, okay, so the first chapter in my book, it is called, What Does INFJ Mean? Now, I'm sure most everybody here knows what INFJ means. I mean, when I first started writing my book, I was like, that seems kind of like a lot to explain what INFJ means, but it's actually one of the questions that I get the most. You would be surprised how many people send me messages, write on um, um, comments, on posts, um, and some of the most liked posts on my page are explaining what an INFJ is. So let's dive in. It might be a review for some of you, but then you might learn some things too. I certainly did. Um, so INFJ is one of the 16 personality types from the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator Personality Test. Um, the letters are your preferences, which mean introvert, intuition, feeling, and judging. So because we are introverted, that means that we recharge by spending time alone. We are intuitive. Um, a simple explanation of that means that we just know things. They come to us naturally. Um, we are feeling, which means that we make decisions based on our gut feelings. And the last letter means judging, which is not judgmental. That is just how we make decisions and how we organize our lives. When I was studying this, one of the things that I thought was most interesting is that um, the INFJ is one of the rarest personality types. And depending on who you ask, it's somewhere, we're somewhere between 1% and 3% of the world. And when you look at it that way, you're like, wow, there really isn't very many of us and we're super rare. And how could there, I mean, how could you even have an audience for a Facebook page or an Instagram page if there's, it's only 1% of the world, right? Um, but you have to think about it in a little bit bigger terms because there's 7.7 .7 billion people in the world, which is a lot of people, right? And if we're only 1% of the world population, that means there's 77 billion, um, no, there's 77. I always get mixed up with all of the numbers. Yeah, so it's 77 million introvert, or INFJs. That's if there's only 1%. If there's 3%, there's 231 million. So I love those numbers because it's very easy for us to think that we're completely alone, right? Like there's nobody else in the world that's like us, that nobody understands us, but there are at least 77 million other people in the world who are just like you, who have the same personality type that you do and the same thoughts and feelings. Um, they probably think that they're alone too. 
Um, and there could be as many as 231 million, which is like, I mean, I can't even imagine that many people being in one place. That's, that's almost two thirds of the United States because there are 330 million people or I always get confused by the numbers, but it's a lot of people, right? Um, okay. So some of the things that make us unique, we need alone time. That's the biggest, most important one. If you don't have enough alone time, you're probably going to be grouchy more so than if you're like hungry or you're tired. Um, we are thinking and feeling. So we use both, both of those sides of our brain. Uh, most personality types are pretty dominant on one and they really don't use the other one very much. It's pretty rare to find one that uses both and we use both. Um, that could be if you have, um, something that, something that you're like fighting with in your head. Um, one of the big things for me is that I like to go on these adventures. Um, and when I moved to Boston, I moved from the Midwest, which is like 1500 miles from, uh, from Boston. And so the feeling side of me was like, this feels like the right decision. I want to do this. And the thinking side of me is like, oh my goodness, what are you thinking? <laughs> like Boston is one of the most expensive places to live in the United States. I didn't know anybody here. Um, renting an apartment is more difficult because you need four months rent up front. And it's not like that in any other place that I had lived. Um, it was difficult to find an apartment. Um, it was difficult to even, they have different words for things. It's almost like being in a different country because some things is, is like, it's kind of confusing, right? So it was almost like learning a whole new culture. And then once I rented a car, when I got here and started driving, I realized the driving is a whole new experience here too. So when I was thinking about moving, it was like, this feels like the right decision. But then there was like this war between, is this really the right thing to do? Even though it feels like the right, like the logic doesn't really match up with the feeling. Um, so how do you go about that? For me, most of the time I have to go with the feeling side because I just can't live with not knowing. So if it feels like the right thing to do, then 95% of the time that's what I'm doing. Um, some of the other things that make us unique, um, we are always thinking about others. We will talk about that a lot more when we get to, um, the functions chapter. There's a whole chapter on functions. Um, we are soft spoken, but we also have really strong opinions that can be kind of confusing to people because a lot of times we're quiet, especially when when we're just getting to know people. And um, so then when we have this really well thought out, super immovable type of position on something that we're super passionate about, it, um, it scares people. <laughs> they don't, they don't get it because, you know, they expect us to be just go with the flow type of people just because um, we're quiet, but that's not always the case. Um, something else that makes us unique is that we like to dream really, really big dreams, but then we'll also put in the work to get those things done. Um, a lot of personality types are either just dreamers, so they just have these vivid daydreams, they just have these, you know, really good imaginations, they just have big ideas, and then other personality types are just you know, like type A doers. They just want to get things done. So it's pretty rare to have both of those things at the same time. Um, something else that makes us unique, we are like hell bent on finding our purpose in life. It's something that comes up pretty easy or pretty early for us. And um, a lot of us struggle with it. I know I did for a long time. Um, and then something else that makes us unique is we like to help other people. Um, we have really big hearts and we're always thinking about other people first. A 
a lot of us have this feeling. In fact, the majority of INFJs that I've connected with, spoken to, we grow up feeling very, very, very different from everybody else. Even though there are millions of us out there in the world, a lot of us don't run into other INFJs naturally or people that we would just um, know are INFJs. Um, so we grow up feeling really, really different because we are different from the majority of personality types, right? And you probably have these thoughts like, why did I have to be born like this? Why can't I just be like everybody else? I know I had a lot of those thoughts too. Um, especially when I was in school, you know, there, there's so many activities that are like, hey, this is a group activity, go find a partner. And I was like, oh, please don't say that. I, and especially in college, there were a lot of group activities. I studied engineering for a while and some of the classes, like our whole class grade was a group activity. Um, I always hated that. If there was a group activity, I wished the teachers would assign the groups because then it was like so much either, easier. Um, cause I really never had a lot of friends and they, and the friends that I did make were never in the classes that I had. So when they were like, okay, everybody go get a group. And I, I would like walk up to the teacher later and be like, I, I don't have a group. Like, can I do this by myself? And some of the teachers would take pity on me and say, yeah. And I'd usually get like the highest grade in the class and others would be like, no, and they'd like, hey, this person doesn't have a group. Who wants somebody extra in their group? And I'm like, oh my God, just kill me now. <laughs> like, Don't embarrass me like that. That's terrible. Don't do it. Um, but it's really difficult when you're younger, right? Because part of the pressure of being in school, in grade school and in college is like you want to be like everybody else and it's very blatantly obvious that you're not like everybody else. But as we get older, we normalize it. Um, we figure out ways to work around it. Um, and it, it gets a little bit easier. I guess maybe we just learn how to cope with it, right? Um, we already know that we're different. It's a common trend in our life. So we're just like, okay, I'll be really different then. Um, instead of eating lunch with the lunch club at work, I'll eat lunch in my car. <laughs> like I'll spend that time, you know, having quiet time so I can recharge. Um, we choose to avoid going out. We stick to just the one or two friends that we like. And we have these very carefully curated lives that feel easy and safe um, because we just don't like all the hurt and rejection of being told that we're different. Um, let me see, I see a comment here that says, do you relate on hating group projects because you feel like others don't understand that you want what you want to accomplish out of a project? Yes, I felt that too. I was always super focused in school, like I wanted a good grade. And a lot of people weren't really that focused. They were interested in having a good time or just passing the time. And I was like, no, I want a good grade. Like, let's put in a lot of work. And they were like, why? You know, we get a C, that's totally fine. And I'm like, no, I don't want a C, I want an A. <laughs> it has to be a really good grade. It can't just be a passing grade. Um, so I think that was part of it too. Um, but yeah, we feel like we're so different and then we just decide, okay, fine. If I'm different, I'll just be different. It'll just be like that. And that's totally fine. Um, it's like we're shielding ourselves from that hurt and that rejection. But one of the biggest points that I wanted to make in this chapter um, is why do you believe what people are telling you? Why do you believe that their version of normal is like the version of normal. Why? Because a lot of why we get told 
you know, there's something wrong with you, basically, is what it boils down to, is um, we're not like they are, right? But how does that, why does that mean that we're wrong? Just because we're not extroverted doesn't mean that there's something wrong with us. I grew up thinking that, yeah, there was something ma massively wrong with me. Like, I was born different, or I was born without something that I should have had. Um, and I let people tell me that, you know, you're broken, you're messed up. There's, there's just something you need to be different. And so I was like, okay, well, how do I need to be different? Like, what, what can I do to fit in with everybody? What can I do to, um, to bridge that gap? And so then it's like, okay, I have to learn how to be extroverted because some people said, you know, introverts are broken extroverts. So I'm like, okay, I have to learn how to be a people person. And after a while of doing that, I realized that I was just exhausted all the time and I hated it. And I did learn how to fit in, but that didn't mean that I felt good about myself. It didn't mean that I liked, um, that I liked the people that I hung out with or the things that we would talk about and it was just so exhausting that I was like I'm not gonna do this anymore I would just rather not have friends than feel this way so it came down to me saying like why do I believe what they're saying just because they tell me that I'm wrong for being quiet for being introverted for wanting to read instead of go out with friends like, who said that they were in charge? Who said that they get to make the rules? Who said that, that they know what they're talking about? What if they don't know what they're talking about? Just because they say it with authority, just because they're older than you are, doesn't mean that they actually know what's going on. It just means that they've appointed themselves to be the expert. And that's what so many experts are nowadays. They're not really... They don't have credentials. They've just determined that they were an expert and they're like, hey, this is how it is. Um, I wrote this blog post a while ago because somebody came to me with this article and they said, what kind of, ex what kind of introvert are you? And I was like, what do you mean? Are there different introverts? And they're like, oh yeah, there are four different kinds of introverts. And so I start reading this article and it basically says introverts are broken extroverts. And there are four different kinds based on what level of anxiety that you have. And here's how you fix, here's how you fix yourself based on what type of broken introvert you are. And so that you can become an extrovert. And I'm like, what? Who wrote that? And who decided that this guy was like, knows what he's talking about? He's some kind of extrovert who decided that introverts were broken. And I'm, that's insane. He doesn't, I mean, an extrovert doesn't know what an introvert feels like. They just, he just was assuming that introverts are quiet because they all have anxiety. Well, that's true. Well, maybe not, not true of all introverts. Some introverts have anxiety. I have anxiety. That's not what makes me recharge though. Um, there are different things. Like you can be shy. You can be an extrovert who's shy and not want to talk to people or have trouble talking to people. Um, you can be an extrovert who has anxiety talking to people, or you can be an introvert who just, you can be an introvert who's shy or an introvert who has anxiety or all of the above, like me, <laughs> or you can just be an introvert who's like, you know what, an hour of talking to people is great for this week, and then I need to spend the rest of the week recharging, and that's just how I operate, and there's nothing wrong with that, it's totally fine. There is definitely a massive lack of empathy there, for sure. People who, they can't put themselves in other people's positions. Um, probably a little bit of narcissism going on there too. Um, yeah, so the second half of this book, I really wanted to bring home the question of why do you believe what they're telling you? Like who made them the expert, you know? Um, and after, years of going through that myself, I kind of came to the conclusion of like, listen, here's what I know to be true. We're not broken. We're not messed up. 
just because we were born differently than they are, just because they don't understand how we operate, that doesn't make us broken. We were born this way for a reason. We were made this specific way for a reason. And we see the world differently than a lot of people see it. We process thoughts and feelings differently. We make decisions differently. We organize things differently. But there's a reason that you were made this way. Even, even if it's really difficult, even if you don't understand it, um, even if you don't know what that reason is, there, there is a reason. And whether you believe in God or the universe or whatever belief that you have, I strongly, strongly believe that you were made the way that you are on purpose and for a reason and that you're perfect just the way that you are. There may still be some things that you need to work on. There may still be some things that you can improve, but you're here in this place the way that you are for a specific reason. Um, have I ever been called arrogant for not agreeing with people's opinions? Um, personally, it's made me sometimes feel guilty or being prideful. I've been called everything in the book. Yeah. Um, my family thinks that I'm way too outspoken. Um, they think that I'm way too blunt. Um, and sometimes I agree with them. Sometimes I am. Um, there's a lot of people who've I'm sure they probably thought I was arrogant. <laughs> some of them were like, um, I can't remember somebody telling me that straight to my face recently. Um, I've been called a lot of other things. Um, but I like to look at it from a perspective of understanding. And that's really what what the whole basis of my writing and my podcast and all the videos that I do and everything, that, that's what it's all based around, right? Is understanding. And I don't see that as being arrogant. I think that people don't like to be called wrong. People don't like it when you question them. And a lot of times when you start questioning people, you will understand or you'll see they'll get mad. And they usually get mad for one of two reasons. One, they either don't want you to know the answer to the question, like they're trying to hide something from you, or two, they don't know what the answer is. And they don't want to be questioned because they don't want to look stupid. They don't want to look like they don't know what they're doing. But that's usually what it boils down to. And I mean, I've learned this over and over and over again. <laughs> um, and, you know, yeah, there are different ways that you can go about it. You know, when you start asking people a lot of questions, you have to understand they're going to get defensive because when people ask you a lot of questions, you might get defensive too, especially if it's like, you know, I don't want to tell you that I don't know, which is a difficult position to be in. For me, I've kind of come to the conclusion that nine times out of 10, the best thing to do is say, listen, I don't know. I don't know the answer to your question, but I'm going to figure it out and I'll get back to you. But most people don't go that direction. Most people are like, they're going to start making accusations against you. And nowadays, it's become popular to do that. If you argue with somebody, if you challenge their opinion, then they're going to start calling you names. And whether it's arrogant or, you know, it goes all the way down the list to whatever they can think of right now that feels like the worst for them. That's what they're going to come up with. But again, it's like, just because they're calling you arrogant, is that true? Does it make you arrogant just because they threw that accusation at you? Um, one of my good friends, she runs into this problem a lot too. And I absolutely adore her because she is very outspoken and, um, she she doesn't know how to sugarcoat things. She'll just tell you like exactly how it is. And sometimes it's like, whoa, <laughs> that was a lot. But then you also know that you're getting the truth, right? Um, so I asked her like, how do you deal with it when people start calling you names? And she's like, well, I was always taught to just to think about what they're saying and say, is that my truth? Does Is that what I believe about myself? 
So when somebody calls me arrogant or some other nasty name, whatever they can think of, then I, I, I'm usually offended, I'll be honest, because, you know, I take things to heart. So my first reaction is like hurt. But then my second reaction is like, is that my truth? Like, am I, do I really believe that I'm arrogant? No, I don't believe I'm arrogant. Um, I could see how people might think that on first, um, you know, with their first impression. But if they really took the time to understand me, they would see that what I'm looking for is understanding. And if I'm challenging them, it's, there's a reason for it. It's like, I don't know if I believe that. So tell me more. Um, and my friends know that about me. I'll ask tons of questions. Um, I want to know why they believe what they do. I want to know their thought process behind what they're saying, their reasoning behind it. And I want to know if I'm wrong too, because there are lots of things that I've been wrong about. You know, a lot of what's in my book, a lot of what's on my blog are like revelations of and it's me wanting to say, hey, listen, I thought this thing for most of my life and it was totally wrong. And I just learned that it's it's not what I thought. <laughs> and I wanted to share that with you. So there are a lot of times when I do admit that I'm wrong and it might take me a while. Um, and sometimes there's some accusations that come from me out of that. When, when I was diagnosed with depression, one of my friends said... I have depression and it sounds a lot like what you're talking about in your life and I think that maybe you could have depression and I was like no I don't like don't say that about me that's like why would you say that and she's like I think you should go and see my counselor and I was like no that like that's not for me uh-uh but then what I was going through kept getting worse and worse and worse and so eventually she said it two or three more times to me and I was like okay like my life is so bad right now, I'll just do whatever. And so I go and see the counselor and after a couple of sessions, she's like, I believe that you have depression. And I was like, that is horrible. Why would you say that? And I'm just like, you know, throwing all kinds of accusations at her. And then after thinking about it for like a month and then doing my own research, I had to go back and be like, so, you know, when you said that I had depression, I think maybe you were right. And all the stuff that I said, yeah, it, I guess it's not true. <laughs> and um, that wasn't fun, but it also wasn't fun going through depression. And it was nice to have somebody that it seemed like every time that I went in to talk to her, she would come up with some other diagnosis or she would say something else. And I would be like, that's not true. Like, I don't believe that. And then I'd think about it for a couple weeks and then come back and be like, yeah, I think you're right. That is, that's probably true. So, yes. All right. So, um, something else, if you want to dive into more about like what this chapter is about. Oh, there was a couple of quotes in here that I wanted to read to you. Um, basically the end of the chapter, it kind of says you were made this way on purpose, right? Um, there are a couple of INFJs that I interviewed on my podcast last year who said some amazing things about this. Um, one of them is named Sierra Mayfield. She said, overall, it makes me feel like I make more sense in the world and I'm not like this weird alien that was just plopped down from another planet. That's a simple thing, but it's just that sense of inclusion in something else with someone else. Even if we are a rare breed, it makes me feel so much better. Um, I love that too. Just knowing that there's even just one other person who makes you, uh, who feels the same way that you do, um, that makes me feel better. Just hearing one person say, me too, um, makes me feel better. Um, and the other one was Laura Shirell. Um, she said, once I read the profile, I was like, this makes so much sense as to why I do what I do. Growing up, I learned really quick that it was more socially acceptable to be extroverted. So I overcompensated in a lot of situations trying to be extroverted. But then I didn't understand why I would feel so exhausted when I would get home or I would be away from people. 
it helped me to emotionally have that release of it's okay to be this way. It's okay to go to a party for an hour or two and then leave and know that you've had your fill of socializing. And that's all that, that's all that you need. Um, I was gonna tell you, there is a lady named Byron Katie. Um, she writes these books and she has this, um, I don't know what you call it, I guess this plan that she does that's called The Work. And it's all about learning how to question your thoughts um, not only question other people and what other people say about you, but to question yourself. Because so much of what we think is a habit. It's stories that we've told ourselves that we've just told ourselves them so many times for so many years that we just believe them to be true. And um, so there are these four questions that you ask yourself uh, when you have this statement. Like um, even something like, you know, somebody called me arrogant. So am I arrogant? Or it's usually a statement like, I am arrogant because I have strong opinions, right? And so you would start with, is that true? And it's, you have to ask yourself this question, is it true? Well, I don't really know it's true. I guess it's true, right? Because somebody else said that. So does that make it true? So then the second question is, do you know it to be 100% true all the time? And then you have to go back and go, no, it's not 100% true all the time. There are times when I'm not arrogant. There are times when I'm like super humble. Um, so no, it's not true 100% of the time. So then the third question is, how do I feel when I believe that that's true? Well, for me, um, when I believe that I'm arrogant, I feel pretty bad because I don't want to be that way. I don't want to come off that way. I don't want people to think of me that way. Um, it makes me feel bad. It makes me feel like I want to change. Um, and I kind of really don't know how to change because it's just like a natural thing for me, I guess. Um, so it really just makes me feel bad and pretty icky, right? So then the fourth question is, how would I act if I believed that that wasn't true? Well, if I believed that I wasn't arrogant, then I wouldn't be worried about it. I wouldn't have any reason to feel bad, right? I wouldn't have any reason to feel icky. Um, I would know that I could have strong opinions and it was totally 100% fine for me to have strong opinions and not be considered ar arrogant. Um, and then, the last thing, so those are the four questions, and then the last thing that she does is to tell you to turn the statement around, right? So what was the statement? Um, I, I am arrogant because I have strong opinions or something like that. So you don't necessarily have to say I'm not arrogant because I have strong opinions. You could turn it around to say I can have strong opinions um, and sometimes be arrogant which is true, right? That does, just because you have strong opinions doesn't mean that you're always arrogant. Um, and then you turn it around again. So you could say, um, sometimes I'm arrogant even when I don't have a strong opinion, <laughs> which, which can be true. Um, there, are, there are situations where I find myself, some, somehow I manage to be like, um, I don't know exactly what the opposite of arrogant is, but like, needy and like not believing in myself at all but then arrogant at the same time which is kind of shocking but sort of funny as well um so there are times when you know you can be arrogant and not have strong opinions um then you turn it around again you turn it around as many times as you can think of um situations for so you could say well just because you have strong opinions doesn't mean that you're arrogant. So how does that make you feel? Well, that makes me feel better. Um, you could also say, um, there's nothing wrong with being arrogant, right? That would, that would be a different thing. Um, a healthy form of arrogance is a good thing. Um, and that probably that might challenge your beliefs about what arrogance is. 
Because a lot of people will tell you, especially when you're growing up, you don't want to be arrogant. You don't want to be that guy, right? But what is a healthy level of, comp of arrogance? Most people call it confidence. And maybe there's some sort of spectrum of like, what's healthy confidence and what's arrogance? Where's the difference? Um, a lot of times, if it's a guy who's quote unquote arrogant, um, people will say, oh, he's just confident. But if a woman says the same thing, then it's like, oh, she's arrogant. Like, she's nasty. Um so you kind of have to, to explore that a little bit too and say, well, is that, was that the situation? Or maybe it's just that you don't like that person or they don't like you. And so <laughs> that's why they chose to say arrogant instead of confidence. Um, there could be a lot of different, um, different situations, but, um, I love Byron Katie. And anytime I get into that kind of situation, I usually start questioning it. Um, and starting with with that and um, like my friend said is that my truth and if it's not your truth then it's totally fine just to set down what they say and move on because you don't need to worry about it if it's not your truth right <laughs> all right so that was what I had for the first um, for the first chapter let me see if there are questions um, I don't see any other questions, so I guess we will call it good tonight. Um, thank you so much everybody who tuned in. I do want to ask you something, a favor, very quickly. If you have finished reading my book, and especially if you bought it from Amazon, I would so much appreciate it if you would go over to Amazon and leave a good review. Um, there is somebody who wrote a review on Amazon that's not even a review of my book, but it's something that's really nasty and there's nothing that I can do about it. So, um, if you guys would go and leave good reviews, I would appreciate it so very much. Um, I will be back again here next Thursday, um, and we'll talk about chapter two. So thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you again next week. I hope you guys have a good weekend. So you just watched that video and I'm sure you enjoyed it. If you want some more amazing information about INFJs, check out these videos right now. I'll see you there.